All right, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks for uh, coming to my talk. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, Postgres at any scale. Uh, just start off some contact information if you have any questions uh, afterwards. Uh, my Twitter is Lineweber, I'm Will Lineweber, and the company I work for is uh, Citus Data, and that's our, our website there. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know me, you may have installed my wonderful gem bundle, which all it is is it requires bundler. And I made this uh, a long time ago, and uh, I, after getting frustrated because you know you do bundle install, bundle update, and so on, but when you want to go install, you had to do gem install bundle er. And I got tired of making that mistake myself so many times, I just made this gem. And it has, uh, all it is is a gem spec, and so this might be the highest number of downloads per line of code of any gem. Uh, so you may have this on your system. So, um, so anyway, this talk, I'm gonna go over uh, three different uh, stages of life in a Postgres database, starting with uh, when you're just starting out and your data is small and how to, um, take good advantage of Postgres's features at that small scale. Uh, and then when you get into a medium size, uh, how that sort of changes, how the operations work for a medium-sized Postgres database. And then when you get to very large scales, uh, some strategies of how you can uh, handle a lot of data. Um, and so, it's not, when you talk about large sizes, there's a couple different uh, things that, that you can mean. You can, Proper use of Postgres depends differently on if you overall data size, but then also on the uh, flux of the data, how much data you're putting into the system, how much data you're pulling out of the system. Uh, you know, a, a database that has you know, just a little bit of data in it, but you're constantly writing and reading is gonna behave differently than a database that may have a lot of data, but you're only ever reading like maybe the most recent amount, and you're not really touching any of the old things. So these are, uh, when you're looking at designing not only your system, but uh, what servers, types of servers you need for your database and so on, uh, it's important to look at both the overall size that you're gonna have and the sort of the, the data processing that you're gonna uh, use. And so before you even get started, you wanna plan, uh, you know, if you can, where your database is gonna end up, where your application is gonna end up. Uh, and that's, you know, of course, easier said than done. Uh, oftentimes things start small and they just keep snowballing out of control while you're scrambling from fire to fire and then it's easy to uh, ignore the database part until it uh, becomes a little bit too late. So I hope that some of the things in this talk will uh, help prepare for that, put some things in place when you are small and uh, you have the time to uh, sort of put some of these constraints in place. Uh, number one, very, the very first thing is please take backups. Now um, every database talk that you go to, someone's gonna say like you should take backups and uh, yes, you should do this. And uh, it's important to not only um, take the backups, but also restore them from time to time to make sure they're good. Uh, and you wanna do this when you're just starting out your database is small because uh, the feedback loop of knowing that you have a good backup system in place uh, helps is a lot easier when the data is small because the total backup restore cycle is so much quicker. Um, and you also maybe don't have as much going on to distract you of like, you know, a system that's been running in production for a while. Uh, when you're also small, the tool that comes with Postgres, PG Dump, it's gonna work very well. Uh, what PG Dump does is it takes a logical backup. And so that means if you need to restore to a different uh, system architecture, a different version of Postgres, that works just fine. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about another tool that does what's called a physical backup. And that one you need to match the same versions and so on. Um, and, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, it's, you know, again, very important that you test your backups. Um, you know, you, you have heard this before, you'll hear it again. I said it before, I'm gonna say it again because it is so important. Uh, you know, please uh, test them. You don't wanna be in a situation where uh, things are on fire and you, that's when you find out that your backups don't work. And um, so please, I just wanna stress this enough. Um, the main thing though that I think is interesting to think about Postgres when you're at a small size is that you can, inf uh, in, embrace the constraints that Postgres allows you to have. Uh, it has a huge number of constraints that you can opt into. Uh, and what I like to think about in this is that you get to enforce the assumptions that you have about your data. Now you might be uh, storing, you, you always think that all of these integers that I'm storing in this, like it's the user's age or, or login count, you might think that there'll always be a positive number. Uh, there's ways in Postgres that I'll show you that you can enforce that to be true 
And that way, um, you're not just, it's not just assumptions in your code that is relying on that data being there, but it enforces it at the database level. Um, and this is really the, the best bang for the buck that you can get uh, out of Postgres. I, and it's, um, I don't think people think about this as an advantage of Postgres as much as it actually is. Um, you know, there's a ton of that you can do with Postgres, you know, fancy common table expressions, uh, index types, esoteric index types, and so on. But I think this is sort of the unsung hero of Postgres, and we're gonna go into that. Um, so it, it also took me a long time to come to this realization that the constraint system is as, as powerful and useful as it is. Um, you know, aside from, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people know that you want to uh, use, if you have a unique column, it's not enough to just say, uh, you know, validates unique in, in Rails because it could change underneath the hood. So you need to put the unique inside the database constraint. Um, but a lot, and so a lot of people know that, but all of these other constraints that we're gonna go into are, you know, for some, for some reason or another, like, seem like they're much less well known. Um, and despite uh, Rails, and, you know, popularizing the things of, you know, embracing constraints, uh, it, that kind of stopped at the database layer. And uh, at least for the initial, you know, several years of Rails history, the database was treated just as like a, a replaceable hash and you could swap from one database to another and, you know, and that's all great. Uh, but I, I, I don't subscribe to that myself. I think that if you can, you know, pick one database and really use its features and, and embrace their constraints and keep that notion from your application down to the database layer, uh, you can have your database do a lot for you. Um, and what I'm, I'm happy that in the last couple years, ORMs like Active Record and uh, my favorite SQL has let you uh, use more and more of database specific features instead of just the least common denominator feature set across all of the SQL databases. And the reason that I think this is so important is because let's say that you uh, write bugs at a constant rate between modifying your database and modifying your code. And I, I do mean you, I, I've never written a bug myself, my code's perfect, <laughs> but, um, but you know, I understand that this happens. And so, let, so if you say that you write uh, codes, bugs at a constant rate, the problem is, is that your code changes so much more frequently than you change your database schema. Uh, just for an example, like one of the apps that I work on, it's a little over a year old, uh, it's had 71 migrations, but it's had uh, over 1,200 releases. And so in each one of those releases is a chance for a bug to be introduced into production. And, um, but, you know, and, but since there's so few changes to the database relative to that, it's easier to get that right and, um, and have that be sort of the last guard against bad data. And, and so if you get something into your application code that starts writing some inconsistent data, you know, maybe not like, you know, database inconsistent, but inconsistent with the logic of your app. Uh, you know, it could go on writing this bad data for weeks before you notice. And then you have this horrible, horrible cleanup process to do, and because you can't figure out what is true and what's not. Uh, and, you know, cleaning up a mess like that, uh, you know, I've seen, uh, I've seen it happen, I've seen, I've worked with people who are working through that, and it's just, uh, it's just really a nightmare. Um, and so, if, you use your database sort of as a last line of defense against bad data. Like, of course you don't want bugs in your application, but if you can have your database reject some of this bad data, uh, you're gonna be in a much better place. Uh, and also, so one, it doesn't let bad data get in, and then also if the database is doing the rejection, you'll know right away when you deploy something bad to production because you'll start getting errors in uh, your application logs that your database was rejecting these writes. And so let's start off very simple. Um, this is maybe the, the simplest constraint that you can put in your database is adding to your columns, not null. And despite how uh, simple this one is, I see uh, time and time again of um, uh, applications that, because by default, when you create a table, you have to opt in to it being not null. I really wish that the SQL standard was the other way around where all columns were not null by default and you had to say, okay, this one I want to allow nulls. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the world that we live in. Um, but as, as simple as this is, uh, I bet right now if you look at your application and you can say, oh, of course, all of my users have a, uh, an email address or you know, something like that. And, but if that's not a primary key, if that's not a not null, if you go look right now, I, there's gonna be some weird cases where uh, something went wrong and like that is nulled out. 
And um, you know, as simple as this is, like, so any of these things that like, you think, like, oh, this should always have that, that's an opportunity to go enforce that in the database. Um, moving on to uh, you know, a little bit higher up is uh, if you say, you know, all my users are gonna have a unique email address, uh, go ahead and make that a unique index. Now, um, it, you pay a little bit of penalty and performance if you create an index that you're, not being, that you're not using, and that's the only way that you can enforce a unique column is by having a unique index. But at this stage of the game, when you're a very small app, it's better to take that performance hit because uh, you're not gonna notice it and have the things be enforced to be unique. And then later on, you know, after your application's been going and like if this is actually the bottleneck, you can go ahead and drop it later. But go ahead and go through you know, all of your columns, all of your tables that like, this should be unique. Go ahead and make it unique. Um, one of the other things that's also very interesting that Postgres lets you do is you can have a unique across two different columns. And so if it's, um, you know, for example, you have a, a, like a, a, a reservation kind of thing where I, want, I don't want anyone to have a, uh, um, you know, have the two reservations, like with the same person with the same other room. You can, have it on, you can make the unique index on both of those. And so um, you can have one user has several reservations and one room has several reservations, but together that is only one set of uniques. And that's a, a very powerful thing that you can take advantage of. A little bit different is to think about data types as constraints. Um, one of the great things about Postgres is that you have like a really wide range of data types. You can have um, you know, your various integers, various text columns, but you can also um, have data types such as, um, I used uh, for one project the INET data type because I was storing MAC addresses and I was able to make sure that only valid MAC addresses were being in. Uh, there was a little bit of a, a little bit of advantage because it stored it just as uh, the number of bytes rather than the string, but really it was just kind of nice to have, um, make sure I know that if anything goes wrong, I'm not gonna get you know, someone's like, uh, name inside the MAC address column. Like as unlikely as that is, like, I can know that that is uh, prevented. Uh, another thing you can do is, um, I've seen some people start to get excited about this part of Postgres and start writing their own data types because uh, the extension system is actually pretty uh, straightforward so you can pop your own uh, semantic data types in your database, which is nice. Um, and then uh, JSONB is a new data type, uh, a couple years old, and uh, what's very nice about this is if you are storing JSON, it can be, uh, you know, make sure first off that it's well formed, um, even if you don't use any of the special operators, but then there are a ton of special operators that you can get data in and out. Um, and there's a, a bunch of great context and other talks about uh, using this sort of data type, the JSONB, to have like a sort of semi-structured approach, which I use in almost all of my tables of having, um, you know, a couple of my real columns and then a JSONB column sort of my semi-structured grab bag to sort of get the advantages of both uh, the relational model and then sort of like a NoSQL uh, semi-structured model. Um, I don't really want this to be a super code heavy talk, but um, this was a little more work to, to show this one off. Um, the, so more, one of the really cool range uh, data types that isn't super well known, especially amongst uh, Rails developers, is the uh, range data type. And so this stores a beginning and an end in one column together. And uh, you can do some really cool things like um, uh, make sure that you know, the beginning is always you know, before the end, like that just happens for you, otherwise it'll redo it. Or you can say that this is an exclusive or exclusive range, you know, if it includes or excludes the, the ends. Um, you can use it with numbers. I've only ever used it with timestamps to sort of do a thing. And this is actually um, straight from our billing table. Uh, uh, you know, what we do is, so the, when you create a, a formation with us, uh, we store when you created it, and then the end time we store as uh, uh, Postgres lets you deal with infinite timestamps, and so we store the end as infinite, and then when you deprovision it, we mark that as the end period, and then you can, we can make sure with um, a little bit of some extra work that there's no overlaps in these periods. And so what this is called is an exclusion constraint, and so we can say we never want to accidentally be billing someone twice for the same formation. So like for example, if we change the price on something, we'll end the old one and start the new one, but it would be a, a disaster if they overlapped at all. And of course, you know, we have checks in code that make sure that doesn't happen, but having this be fixed in the database 
uh, was uh, you know, just so much a, a weight off my mind knowing that the database is going to reject any sort of uh, things that would result in uh, billing someone incorrectly. Uh, there is one little trick here. Uh, we're using UIDs for our, our primary columns. And uh, unfortunately, you can't easily use UUIDs in an exclusion constraint. And uh, we found this little hack, and what that does is just, uh, it's an internal method of Postgres that takes a UUID and sends it out as just a byte uh, array. And byte arrays do work in exclusion constraints. So this, it's unfortunate you have to do this, but it's a nice little uh, trick. Um, and then uh, enums. Uh, these ones I'm, I'm not super sold on myself. Like I'm, I'm using them more and more now. Uh, for example, uh, they're very good for like small sets of keys that you're not going to be changing so much. So for example, I'm using them for AWS regions. Because sure, they do add more regions over time, but it's not that often. And this just prevents like little typos of like, uh, I know one time I said like US uh, WAST one instead of WEST, like manually in IRB, and then that got saved, and then like that was hard to track down. So having that, you know, again, like it just prevents these little, time, little small errors. Um, and then if all that's not enough, I know that was a lot, but if that's not enough, Postgres has this one last thing, which is really awesome, called a check constraint. So you make a function, uh, usually in just in PL SQL in Postgres, but um, I've also done this with the uh, PLv8, which lets you run JavaScript inside Postgres and use that for my check constraints. And what this is, is a function that you define, and every time you do a write, an insert, an update, uh, it'll just run your, your row with that thing, and then you can say, is, is this good or bad? And so this way you can do things like, uh, you can say that I only want positive numbers. I only want um, maybe for some reason you only want to store Fibonacci numbers. You can, you can do a, a check like that. Like really, you know, any sort of um, custom validation that you want to do, um, uh, you can do. Uh, honestly, though, this is probably in sort of the diminishing returns. Like this is sort of like, I don't think I'm using any check constraints in production right now. Um, it's nice to know that it's there, but uh, this is maybe getting a little bit, a little bit too far. And so that's it for sort of the small sizes. Thinking more about medium sizes, um, this is, you know, maybe when you start getting above 100 gigs, or you start doing a lot of writes. Um, the, the interesting thing about this period, um, when I was putting the talk together, is I realized that most people don't spend a whole lot of time here. Either it's an application that stays small, or it's one that's just like shooting right through medium up to the large scales. But there's still some times to take a look at your uh, database and uh, make some improvements at this stage. Um, so hopefully you're in a good place with constraints and data types and all that stuff from before. Um, if not, this is a good time to go review that and like do some uh, uh, homework. But um, so if we assume that we're in a good space with the, the structure of our database, um, the biggest difference here is you start running out of uh, RAM on your database to keep everything cached. And so, um, so you can, you can do some strategies like deleting old data, uh, that kind of helps, but it, it tends to just kind of postpone the problem. Um, this is when you, uh, taking logical backups with PG dump doesn't quite work anymore. Um, the, this tool here, uh, Wally, um, so me and uh, m my colleague who wrote this, uh, we spent five years at Heroku Postgres and we, we ran this on every single uh, database cluster on Heroku and we're using it today. It's all open source. Um, if you're running a database by yourself, please, please, please use Wally. What it does is it takes the write ahead log files that Postgres generates and sends it off the machine to S3. Uh, there's some other plugin backends if you're using Azure or uh, GCE or something like that. There's uh, other backends it can do, but the main one that most people use is S3. And what's great about this um, is uh, if the machine were to disappear completely off the face of the internet, you can restore uh, everything from these write ahead log files. And uh, fortunately, uh, back in 2000, 11, right before one of these big, big Amazon outages, we just put this in place on everything on Heroku Postgres, like right before the outage, like a couple weeks. And if that wasn't there, um, I would probably still have a job, but I don't know how good the uh, database team would have been. <laughs> uh, it it would have been, it would have been, it would have been bad. Um, so please, please, please use Wally. -E. Um, again, it's important to test this. Uh, one thing that we do is we use the Wally -E infrastructure for um, 
when we want to do a, like a create a follower or you know so on, like we're using that same infrastructure all the time, and that way we know implicitly that these backups are good and valid. Um, this is when you want to start thinking about having a hot standby. So you know, having this running continuously, so if your main thing goes, you want to fall over to it. Uh, when you're at the smaller sizes, it's not that important because you can uh, just restore quickly from, from any sort of backup. But when you start getting a lot of data, just the, the time it takes to you know, send the data over the network to start restoring it just starts taking longer and longer. So having a hot standby up um, is very good. Um, one of the nice things that Postgres has that, again, isn't super well known uh, in developer communities is with the async replication it has, on a transaction by transaction basis, you can say, this is an important transaction. I want this to be synchronous. Like, let's say it's a new user signing up. And that one, it won't return until it uh, has written it to the replicas. But for the most of your transactions, you can leave that as um, asynchronous mode. It'll return right away and you just trust that it'll make it there um, eventually. And being able to mix those two for your important and like, you know, not as important data is uh, extremely powerful. Um, again, you have to invest in monitoring and alerting, and this is another thing that everyone says you should do, but people tend to do only until it's a little too late. Um, and this is you know, sort of a theme with a lot of these things when I was putting this talk together, like a lot of these things are like, I can get up here and tell you, oh, you should do this, you should do this. But um, I was trying to think of like, why is it the case that everyone says you should do it, but like it turns out like no one is actually doing it. And I was reminded of this talk that I saw uh, a YouTube video of, uh, Flirting with Disaster um, is the name of the paper, and then the talk was this results in complex uh, additive systems. You can uh, look for that on GitHub. And I'm gonna redo part of it here because I just thought, like, when I was reminded of this, I was, this is actually maybe the explanation of why people don't do what they ought to do. Um, and so if you think that you have this, um, this one of the boundaries of a system is the economic boundary. And you can uh, go towards it, but if you go past it, this is when your company fails and goes out of business. And so there's a natural gradient there pushing you away from economic boundary because otherwise your company's gonna go out of business. And so you, you go up to the line and then you get pushed right back down. There's another boundary of the workload boundary. This is how much you can work your employees at your company. And again, like if you push it too far, they get burned out and quit. And so, um, you know, again, there's a natural gradient away from there. And then finally, there's a performance boundary. And this is sort of the, the interesting one for our systems. Um, the problem is, is you don't know where the performance boundary actually is until you go past it. And so what we do is we set up this error margin and we say, you know, we're only gonna operate our systems at like this capacity or this, you know, this is the performance, these are the uh, how many requests per second we wanna be hitting and no, no, no worse than that. The, the problem is you, you tend to go over it and then, you know, you kind of freak out and you go, oh no, and you, you bring it back and you, you keep going, you keep going over it and then going back. But then after that happens a couple times, you're like, well, why are we freaking out so much? Why don't we just you know, push the, you know, it's fine, the, op, the system's operating fine, let's, let's push the boundary back. The problem is you don't know actually where that actual boundary is until eventually you go over and you, know, you have a big outage and, um, and it's a problem. And that, I never got to use the fire thing before, so I wanna, I wanna just, I wanna do it one more time. That's, <laughs> that's nice. Um, and so anyway, so you have a big outage and everyone freaks out and they're like, okay, we never want that to happen again. And you push, you know, I don't care how much uh, money it costs, I don't care uh, you know, how much we have to work, let's, let's never have this embarrassing outage again. So you push it all the way against. But the problem is over time, like, you, know, you start thinking like, oh yeah, you remember that outage from a couple years ago? Oh yeah, that was bad. And like, ha ha ha. And then you're, you're right back repeating this again and again. And, um, and I think that really explains why there's all these things that you know you, know you should be doing, but like until you hit it, like that's, uh, you know, that, that's what happens. And I really, um, yeah, I remember when I first saw this for the first time, like I, I encourage you to go watch this talk. It's only like uh, maybe 20, 25 minutes on YouTube and it's, uh, he does a better job of explaining it than I just did. But um, I, I, thought, I really thought that was an interesting way to uh, think about systems. So finally, you start running out, you know, no matter what strategies you do, you put in place, eventually if your data keeps growing, you're gonna come to a point where it just can't fit in a single machine anymore. Um, 
And so what you can do there, like a very popular approach, is sharding. And so this uh, is, instead of having your application, which is the star, talk to one giant database, you make lots of little small databases and have your application talk to, to all of them. Uh, you know, people have been doing sharding for a long time. There's a lot of um, homespun approaches. You want to, you, know, you know, a lot of people do this in their application layer. Uh, but this is where, um, you know, the company I joined a year ago uh, is sort of meant to help with that. And so um, Citus is an open source uh, Postgres extension that you install on Postgres, you install on a couple other nodes of Postgres, and it transforms it into a distributed sharded uh, database. Um, and yeah, so uh, it's open source, you know, you're welcome to go uh, check it out and run it yourself. The, um, yeah, so as soon as you, you outgrow the single node Postgres, uh, what, what Citus does is it takes care of not only just the sharding, so when you do a write, it goes into the correct node, but also the reads, it'll distribute that out against all the machines in your cluster and so on. Um, this is sort, you know, sort of a, a, complicated, a complicated view of it, uh, but it's actually, the, the approach that we take is actually you know, pretty uh, simple and straightforward. And so we have these idea of workers and shards, but really all they are are Postgres servers and tables. And so um, you can go peek into all of these things inside and it's just uh, you know, standard Postgres like that's being stored and used. Uh, so for example, I have these uh, two tables. Uh, one is uh, CloudWatch metrics and the other is just a general events table and they're both sharded tables. And so when I, when I look at this from my application, it just looks like one table. Like it, my application doesn't have to know that anything funny is going on. Uh, it just connects over regular Postgres and it's one table. But if you connect to any of these workers in the back, you can see that what's really going on is there's a lot of uh, you know, tables here and each one of those tables on that server is a shard. And you know, another server is gonna have another set of shards and so on. And so when writes come in, you say um, that you know, one of these tables, um, this is my shard key. We go ahead and run a hash function on that. We know what shard it's going to go to and then we write it to that one shard. Uh, and just to show that, uh, you know, how it works, uh, most Postgres stuff is done with these so-called catalog functions that are under the hood sort of like somewhat hidden from you. And so we have a, uh, a catalog function here that, or a catalog table that shows the start and end range of each one of the shards that is created. And so we run the hash function, we know if it's, you know, from int min to a little bit over int min, uh, we know what shard that goes to. And then, you know, the next set and so on. And so that's how the, the writes work. But when you want to you know, think about how to architect your application for taking advantage of uh, you know, distributed Postgres, uh, there's really two kind of ways that you can think about it. Uh, one is more for real-time SQL on like event data. So let's say you're taking, you're tracking uh, clicks or page views or um, you know, metrics from your system, so on. And the other one is more of a multi-tenant model, um, which I'm gonna start with first. Uh, the multi-tenant model is more, let's say you're building an application like Salesforce where each you know, customer of Salesforce has their own set of data and it doesn't you know, go from customer to customer. Um, and you know, this, this uh, is a model for like a lot of uh, companies where um, their customer's data doesn't mix with each other. Um, and what's nice about this is it's easy to migrate to. Uh, it's easy to maintain because all of the Postgres features that we talked about before, the uh, backups, the Wally for uh, you know continuous uh, write ahead log protection, um, scaling works. You can both get bigger individual nodes and you can add more nodes to the system, um, and so on. And the way that this works is, all of your tables, if you denormalize it a little bit and add the customer or tenant ID to each one of the tables, um, when your queries come in, as long as it has like where customer ID or uh, where org ID equals three, we know that all of that data is just gonna be on one particular node, so we can send all the queries there, and that just behaves exactly like um, a single node Postgres at that point. It doesn't have to be concerned with all the other data of all the other customers, and you get the results back. Um, and this is more, if you were going to shard yourself, if you're gonna say, oh, I need to you know, build an application and uh, I need to, do the sharding. This is probably much like what you would do in your own application code, uh, but this way, you know, it's all taken care of and you don't have to maintain all that code in your application. Um, 
but it's more analogous to what you think, what, what people think about uh, sharding. The other model is the more parallel uh, model. And wh what's great about here, here is that um, you can uh, have your data not just, you can insert it in one place, but the queries, when they come in, they get distributed across all of the nodes, all of the, all of the machines in your cluster. Um, what's nice about this is, one, that it's Postgres. And so if you started with Postgres, you don't have to, when you get to these larger scales, you don't have to re-architect your system so much to uh, you know, use some other model. Um, you can also, if you have a Postgres team in your, your company, people experience with it, you don't have to, like, they don't have to go learn how to operate and maintain a completely different database. And then also, because it is Postgres, whenever Postgres comes out with a new feature, such as like JSONB a couple years ago, all that comes for you, because it's just you know, extension on top of Postgres. Yeah, so when the query comes in, it, like I said, we do a distributed querying planning phase where all of the nodes get hit, and then it comes back, uh, the data. And what's nice about this also, it's not very common that someone's query is CPU bound. Usually what I see customers, uh, Postgres users, it's more like memory bound, but occasionally you'll have a query that is CPU bound. Uh, Postgres, when you connect, of course, it uh, forks a backend, and it's largely single-threaded. Uh, there's been some advances, uh, 9.6 and the next version, where se sequential scans are done in parallel, but uh, you know, largely you're, you're gonna be single-threaded. But because this is working on all of the nodes in your cluster, you get to use all of the CPU all at once, and so you know, I've seen some cases of even like five, 700 times improvement because uh, it could use all the CPUs at once. Um, we also have a, you know, one example of um, Citus MX, which lets you connect to any, any single node instead of just one coordinator node. And um, uh, using the, the Yahoo cloud serving benchmark, uh, we were able to get um, you know, about half a million writes per second on a 32 node cluster. Um, when we were doing bulk insert, it was like seven million, but that's kind of cheating because uh, bulk insert is not usually people's uh, workload pattern. Um, and what this this is this is a pretty cool way we, we, how we worked around that you can connect to any node. Um, it's a you know a DNS entry that does round robin. So when you connect, it just goes to any one of the backing nodes, and then they communicate with each other. Um, and then finally, um, we have a, a gem that you can use. Uh, if you're using the multi-tenant model, and uh, instead of saying belongs to, you say that I'm multi-tenant on user, and then inside your code blocks, you can wrap it in this uh, with uh, block, and then it makes sure that Active Record scopes all of your queries with that proper org ID. And uh, what's nice about this is you can use this um, even before you start using Citus. You can have your, your as long as your columns have tables have those columns, you can have this in place, and then when you need to uh, scale out, everything is all uh, ready to go. Um, that's all I have for you, thank you very much. Um, we do have, um, you know, I can answer maybe a couple questions now looking at the time, but also we do have a booth um, and I'm happy to help uh, talk there, but thank you very much. Uh, sorry, so the question is using, instead of an integer using what? Uh, like where you, uh, oh, UUID. Oh, UUID, yeah, so I, um, yeah, so the question is using UUIDs as uh, things instead of integers. Um, so I like it a lot. Uh, some, some of my um, more uh, Postgres DBA colleagues uh, warn against it because it does take up more space and joins are uh, a little slower. But I, I just really like using UUIDs everywhere just because like, I know that, you know, one, I, if I do shorten URLs, I'm not exposing uh, secrets about my system. And then also, um, like, I don't know, I think it's, it's fine. But it, it, it could be a performance bottleneck. It's something to be aware of. Um, but I, I tend to go with UUIDs as IDs first. And then only in, if, I, if, it, if I can think about it and it's really going to be a problem, then maybe go to integers. And also, if you are using integers for your columns, please use BigInt. Um, it's, uh, it, it actually takes up the same amount of size in the database because uh, the things are memory aligned to uh, 64 bits anyway, and um, only the only time it would save you space is if you have two 32-bit types together because of the, the bit packing, which you probably don't have. So please, please use BigInt. Otherwise, you're going to have a, a really nasty migration problem surprise you after um, what 32 million. So please use BigInt.
Um, yeah, so one terabyte is um, you know, starting to get big. Um, uh, so the question is uh, how, how easy is it to migrate once you're at one, one terabyte. Um, if you can take the downtime, like a dump restore uh, can be pretty quick because uh, the way that dumps restore work is they, they omit a lot of the header uh, framing data, so it's just the tuples coming in. Uh, I would see if, the, like just take a dump and see how long that takes and like if that's an acceptable downtime. Um, but the, the there, there usually are some changes that, to the application layer, but uh, because it is still Postgres, like um, that part isn't, like usually it's just the downtime of migration that people are worried about. Usu the actual code changes tend to be, okay, they're, like some queries you might have to rewrite, but usually it's not so bad. Especially if it's multi-tenant. Um, that makes it a lot easier. Uh, so the question is if you're medium size, is there performance to sharding then? Um, there can be, especially if you do have CPU bound queries. Uh, the other thing is it's always easier to start sharding before everything's on fire. Uh, because when it, once you start getting big, then you know, then it's more like a scramble. Like, so like I, it, it's hard, again, because of the flirting with disaster thing, it's hard to get people to do it before it's painful. But um, I would you know, project your data growth and see like work back in time when you start having to, um, having to do it. Uh, yeah, so what have I used in, in past year testing on the database? And mostly that was for backups and restores. Um, uh, mostly just, uh, I haven't found like a good tool that you can use. It's mostly like just writing a couple scripts that, you know, run it, uh, you know, once a day and, you know, try and, you know, make sure that it did restore. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's any good, not, not that I know of any good off-the-shelf tools, but like, you know, like, down, as, as long as you can get the authentication of where to download your backups from, um, like you're looking at, you know, like maybe a 20 line Ruby script that like maybe sends an email after it didn't work. Um, so I, I, yeah, it's mostly been hacky homespun stuff. All right, that looks like it. Thank you very much. Uh, please check us out uh, at the booth if you have any more questions.